Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. His name was Ryan Gardner. Now you may not know him, but you probably know someone or knew someone like him. Imagine this. The school bell rings. The doors fling open. Kids rush out onto the empty lot where real education happens, the playground. And then kids start to congregate on an open field around a football. Two captains emerge, and then the rest of the kids line up in a row. It's time for selection. Who's going to be on whose team? And the first kid picked every time, unless he's a captain, Ryan Gardner. Why? Because he was really athletic. Ryan was the kid who out on the playground could throw farther, run faster, kick better, and catch pretty much anything you threw at him. And so he got picked first. Why? Because any kid who knew what it meant to play football on the playground knew that you wanted Ryan on your team. Because if Ryan was on your team, you had a really good chance of winning during that recess. It's kind of amazing, but Paul this morning in our lesson, says something kind of similar. He talks about having the right person on your team or the right person backing you. This morning, as we listen to Paul's words from Romans 8, the question that we're really going to focus on is if God is for us, who can be against us? And as we think about this question, we're going to look at two other questions that Paul asks, which is who can bring an accusation against us and who or what can separate us from his love. Now, our section that we're looking at this morning is from Romans 8, 31 through 39. And I'm going to tell you right now, we don't have enough time. We don't have enough time to study this rich, deep section of Scripture. I'm just pulling out a couple points. And so I'm going to encourage you today to take home your bulletin or open up your Bible when you get home and just reread Romans 8, 31 through 39 and meditate on it. Because it is so rich and so deep. And it is such a beautiful demonstration of God's love for us. With that being said, we're going to focus on that question that I had talked about. Now our lesson this morning starts off this way. Paul starts out this section. He says, what then will we say about these things? Now when Paul is talking about these things, I want you to realize he's not just talking about the verses before 31. He's talking about all of Romans before chapter 8, verse 31. This is a summary of the first half of the book of Romans. So when he says, what shall we say about these things? He's talking about everything he's written in the letter so far. And he continues. He continues after saying, what shall we say about these things? He says, if God is for us, who can be against us? And what an amazing question to ask. As Christians, this question is one that we should carry with us always. This is a question that hits right at the heart and soul of our peace, right at the heart and soul of our comfort. If God is for us, who can be against us? I'm going to encourage you just to remember that question, to take it home, to put it in your back pocket. And as you go throughout life, if ever there's a moment when something difficult comes up, if ever you're scared or worried, pull this question out and ask yourself, if God is for me, who can be against me? And Paul fills out this question with what he says next. It's another question, but he points us to the gospel. He says, Indeed, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also graciously give us all things along with him? This is the sweetest, purest message that this world has ever heard. It is the message of God's son, Jesus Christ, for you and for me. You'll never hear a better message than the one that Paul speaks right there. Because the truth is, is if God has given up his one and only son, his son whom he loves and is well pleased with, what will he refrain from you that you need? Nothing. And as we look at these questions, Paul is really teaching us about our life, our life of repentance, with these rhetorical questions where he expects really a negative answer to them. And the question that we're going to spend the most of our time looking at comes right after this beautiful gospel proclamation. The question is this, who will bring an accusation against God's elect? 
God is the one who justifies. No one can stand, stand up and place an accusation against a believer. Now what you might be thinking to yourself is, whoa, whoa, pastor, slow down. You see, I've had people accuse me of all sorts of things. Even when I'm doing the loving thing, I've had people accuse me for being unloving. Well, hold on. Paul is not saying that people will not accuse you. And Paul is not saying that you are sinless. Well, the truth is, is we're all sinful, aren't we? If we were to take our actions, our life, and place them before God, and have God judge them according to his Ten Commandments, his holy, perfect law, we would all fail. We would all deserve death and eternity and hell. And if you don't believe me, just look at your own life. Think about the times when you've caused hurt to someone you love with your words or your actions. Or think about those behaviors that you have, those, those bad habits, those sinful habits that you hide away from everyone else. Those habits that you don't show anybody or tell anybody about because if they knew that you had these habits, well, they would look at you in disgust. Or if they knew what you were thinking about a certain thing, well, then they would probably push you away. Or think about those moments in life that come back to haunt you. Those moments in life where you feel regret and guilt. And every so often when you're at a certain place or see a certain person, those moments of guilt just are relived and hashed out right in front of you again and again. You see, the truth is, is we are sinful and we deserve to die. But Paul is not saying that we're sinless here. And he's not saying that no one will bring an accusation against us. The truth is, is our enemy, the devil, his name, Satan, means slanderer. It means accuser. It means he's going to cast every accusation at us that he can possibly manage. And the world that we live in mimics his spirit. You just turn on the news and see that Christians are accused of all sorts of things, of being unloving for speaking God's word and truth. But you see, what Paul is saying here is not that people won't cast accusations against us or that we are sinless, but what Paul is saying is none of those will stick to our record. No accusation that the world brings before us, no accusation that is hurled at us can stick in the blood of Christ. Those moments of regret and guilt that you have in, the, in your life, those times of of sinful words and sinful actions and sinful thoughts are washed clean in the blood of the Lamb. If ever you do have a moment that just keeps coming back and you feel guilty about it, take that moment and nail it to the cross because it's on the cross that your sins were paid for. It was on the cross where Jesus shed his blood for you and for me. And because he did that, we are declared innocent before God. God is the one who justifies, who says that we are innocent because his son died for our sins. And what's even more is Paul kind of carries out this picture even further because he says this. After he says, after he says who, who is the one who brings an accusation, excuse me, after he says, who will bring an accusation against God's elect, God is the one who justifies. He goes on to say, who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is the one who is at God's right hand and who is also interceding for us. Imagine you were going to stand before a judge on trial for an action that you have committed. It'd be scary, wouldn't it? Now think about this. Think about if that judge that you were standing before is not just another person, but it is the Almighty God. It is the creator of the universe, the one who formed everything with his word. And you know that he says, if you want to be in my presence, you must be holy as I am holy. You must be perfect as I am perfect. And you know that he will not let sin go unpunished. It's a scary thought, isn't it? Until you realize who your judge is. Your judge is the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who loves you and who has paid for all of your sins already. 
No one can condemn you in the blood of Jesus because your sins have already been paid for. Jesus will never forget the fact that he came to this earth, lived perfectly in your place, and then took the punishment of your sin upon himself and died and experienced your hell. Jesus will never forget that. In fact, his body still bears the mark of the payment he made for your sin and my sin. You are forgiven. And there is no accusation. There is nothing that can stand between you and God because Christ has washed them all clean. And Paul continues, not only, not only can no one bring an accusation against those who are God's elect, but the truth is, is God's love is with us wherever we go. Paul says in the last five verses, he says this, What will separate us from the love of Christ? Will trouble or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Just as it is written, For your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor rulers, neither things present nor things to come, nor powerful forces, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. God promises that nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Now there might be times in our life when we feel like we are separated from God's love, that we think we are separated from God's love. But what does Paul say? Nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Now I could sit here and say, let's take a minute and think about all of the things that might separate us from God's love. But you know what? That'd be a waste of time. Because the truth is, is nothing can separate you from God's love in Christ Jesus. Doesn't matter. You could climb to the top of the highest mountain and you could still find God's love in Christ there. You could swim to the bottom of the deepest trench in the ocean and you'd still find God's love there in Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter. Any, nothing in life can separate you from that love that's in Christ Jesus. Doesn't matter what comes your way. You could get cancer. You'd still have God's love in Christ Jesus. Your loved ones could die. You'd still have God's love in Christ Jesus. And you could endure some very terrifying situations, some very extreme situations, like the ones that you see on the news that people go through. Shootings, like at the one in Parkland. Well, the truth is, God's love through Jesus Christ is still there. No matter where you go, no matter what you do, God still loves you. And he pours out his love to you through Jesus Christ. And if ever you feel or you think that you, for some reason, don't have God's love, well, then remind yourself of God's promises. Remember the times when God speaks specifically to you and to me in his word and promises you what he gives us. That passage that I'm sure you're all familiar with. For God so loved the world, you are a part of the world, that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Hear the message of comfort that Paul gives us today from Romans. That we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Through Jesus Christ, God has given us everything that we need to live here on this earth and to inherit eternal life in heaven. And if that doesn't do it, remind yourself of your baptism. Go back to the moment when God said, you are my child. And on this one, the forgiveness of sins of Christ have been credited to his account or her account. And you can keep going. You find yourself a group of believers that you agree with and you confess your unity with them, then celebrate the Lord's Supper. Receive the forgiveness of sins through Christ's body and blood. You see, God's love is all around us in the means of grace. In his word and in baptism in the Lord's Supper, the sacraments, make use of them. And realize, realize that your relationship to God really doesn't depend on how strong you are. But it all depends 
about our father's grip. Think of your relationship with God as a father hanging on to the hand of a little child. And that little child is bound to slip and fall. And that little child doesn't have the strength to hold themselves up. But who does? The father does. And the father shows us his strength and strengthens us through his promises. And so when we hear Paul say, if God is for us, who can be against us? The answer is, it doesn't matter. Because we have God on our side. Sure. As a kid, I wanted Ryan Gardner on my team. Because any kid knew that if you had him on your team, you had a pretty good chance of winning during that recess. Brothers and sisters, we don't just have a pretty good chance at victory in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, we have victory itself. Look to Christ. See Christ as the payment for your sins. Listen to his promises. Listen to the promises that the Father gives to you about him and let those promises wrap around you and strengthen your faith. And know that if God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. Please stand.